Hello everybody, welcome to MNB World Talk Script. So this time we have invited a very unique lady who was awarded one of Britain's 10 most talented young researchers. Also, she received a scholarship from the uh, 1851 Royal Commission for her doctorate degree at Oxford University. And currently she works as Earth Observation Specialist at the Satellite um, Application Catapult in the UK. Please welcome Ms. Marut Bayra. Yes, thank you very much for your coming. <laughs> thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. <laughs> so uh, long titles, yeah. <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah, so uh, really honored to have you here in our studio. So you might be very busy. So thank you for your time, first of all. And of course, congratulations for being uh, <laughs> one of the toppest uh, mm -hmm. in the even in the UK so and also for receiving the scholarship wow so could you please tell us uh, about each of them so what feeling did you get when you've become one of the toppest one of the top <laughs> researchers in the UK and also when you received this scholarship please yeah um, thank you so much for having me sure. here it's <laughs> such a pleasure uh, yeah so um, uh, I guess I feel very humbled <laughs> and uh, I, I feel very lucky to be joining the kind of Royal Commission family yes. uh, who have like some of my kind of heroes as some of their um, kind of alumni. So an example of a hero is um, uh, like a Peter Hicks, uh, who, who's a Nobel laureate and mm -hmm. he's the kind of, uh, I guess, yeah, the, he's known for the Higgs boson. He's a physicist and he's uh, one of the kind of, you know, original Royal Commission wow. fellows. Um, yes. And um um, I, I really like kind of what he said uh, was really special about wow, the award, what, what did he uh, say? which was kind of like um, um, it's kind of the, the kind of freedom that you get um, in the research. So like um, you get to define your own research agenda, but also in terms of like intellectual property, it's um, there's lots of freedom. Mm -hmm. So um, and I agree with him because um, uh, I guess, you know, when, uh, for example, if you have funding for your research from like a commercial company, sometimes you can't publish as freely. Yes. And in terms of the, uh, the, the particular fellowship that I have is an industrial fellowship, which means that, um, so there's 10 of us and all of us have to be, uh, first of all, doing um, kind of uh, research that's quite frontiers in each of our fields um, and then uh, like cutting edge and then that research has to be of course in like a really nice institution but I think the thing that's really important is uh, we all have to be also kind of have one of our feet uh, one feet uh, in industry so yes. that uh, it's not you know science for science's sake uh, we wanted to have real world impact and I think that's kind of how it was judged um, in mm -hmm. terms of yeah Yes. kind of promise for real world impact. Mm, I see. And could you please tell us exactly the research work itself? Mm -hmm. mm. So uh, the title is um, kind of a satellite based early warning system for geotechnical structures. Um, Genius. I, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, so so uh, I guess uh, the really a new thing about my research is the fact that I'm bringing together three very kind of uh, different and siloed um, industries together into my research. So there's a satellite-based uh, monitoring and geology. Uh, a little bit different, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> so satellite-based monitoring, and then there's uh, like machine learning AI, and then there's geotechnics. So. Um, I guess, yeah, uh, basically uh, from satellites, you can monitor millimetric ground movement. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, structures uh, have to, uh, they're designed to be able to move when you construct them. So every time it moves, you can't be generating an alert that says, oh, it's moving, you know, something's <laughs> happening, you know. <laughs> so um, that's why uh, with the satellite uh, monitoring, there's the geotechnical bit modeling to understand, you know, uh, the mechanics of the movement. And then I'll be training um, machine learning algorithms like AI uh, to understand, you know, this is a normal movement. This is a very dangerous movement. Mm -hmm. So. And can you predict, for example, those earthquakes or hurricanes? Um, uh, so um, the, the particular angle that I'm kind of taking isn't uh, to do with the natural disasters. It's more kind of um, oh, uh, it's more the structure changes. Exactly, I exactly. See. Mm -hmm. So, um, and could you please tell us about your current work? So, satellite applicants catapult. So, how long have you been working there? Yeah, so um, uh, I've been working there for four years mm -hmm. um, and the Satellite Applications Catapult, uh, so they're a, uh, we're a 
uh, kind of like a part UK government funded innovation and technology hub. Mm -hmm. um, so there are uh, catapults for many different um, industries. So there's a catapult for energy systems, there's a catapult for gene therapy, there's a catapult for many different industries. And I work for the kind of government hub for satellites and space. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so amazing. Thank you. Um, now I would like to introduce you to our viewers a little bit more. Okay. <laughs> Satellite data is quite a unique term for me. <laughs> so, and could you please tell us what should be done in Mongolia to develop this industry as UK does? Wow, big question. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think satellite data is kind of, um, uh, it's kind of invisible, but it is in all our lives. So for example, Google, you use Google Maps, right? So yes. that's satellite data. Yes. Um, and in terms of, uh, kind of uh, what should be done to develop this industry. So um, I think there's already quite a lot of interesting stuff happening in Mongolia um, related to satellite data and space industry. So, for example, uh, at the National University of Moose, uh, there's, you know, in the geography department, they already have a really nice course uh, kind of uh, teaching uh, remote sensing. And uh, in the physics department, for example, they have an organization called MOSTA, which is a uh, Kind of Mongolian Space Technology Association, who have you know uh, who flew the Mazalai satellite, mm. and they have really cool experiments that went there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's you know the Mongolian Geological Survey, who are doing some really nice uh, remote sensing work as well. And uh, of course, there's uh, some interesting projects like the Mars V. I guess uh, there's lots of exciting work happening in Mongolia, but I think what we're really missing something like a Mongolian Space Agency, like a kind of like a strategy, like a policy to bring together all these exciting um, activities. Um, and I guess the final thing I want to say was that, you know, uh, space and satellites might seem very far to us, but actually um, they are... Here. Exactly, exactly. And they can be used to solve some of our biggest problems. Uh, so an, an example of kind of, you know, so we need to look at space and satellites through like a commercial lens. So um, an example of a company I really like um, is uh, in the UK, there's a company called uh, Chai. Uh, it's a commodities AI. So they're a company who made up of experts in finance and uh, AI. So what their job is to basically look at all the world's data and trying to kind of predict commodity prices, right? Mm -hmm. And recently they've joined the space industry and got some funding for that, which is exciting because now they've realized that, you know, actually satellite data offers this alternative data source for them to look at uh, the kind of commodities prices and that gives them a competitive edge over their company. So, you know, agriculture, mining, all these um, industries that are big in Mongolia um, have opportunities to be using satellite data to save money to... Yeah. Right. So we talked about from, uh, from the perspective of general citizens, general specialists, what they should do to improve, to develop this industry. But uh, previously, you also mentioned about that uh, the UK's government also supports mm. to develop this industry, right? So uh, from that point of view, could you please tell us what Mongolian government should do to improve this uh, industry here? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really good question, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I guess um, uh, as I previously mentioned, I think, um, you know, a Mongolian uh, space agency uh, would be really great because, you know, because uh, then uh, there'll be a general policy and a strategy to bring together yes. all these exciting activities that are already happening. United. Exactly. Right. Um, and then, you know, there's a, there's a you know, JAXA, Japanese Space Agency, UK Space Agency, European Space Agency. Basically, every country has a space agency. And you don't need to have fancy satellites to have a space agency. Mm -hmm. It's more like a policy thing. Uh, so that's number one, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, number two is uh, one of the things I really like talking about is... Um, like uh, the UK, for example, has something called the Department for International Trade. Mm -hmm. And that, I really love that model because, uh, for example, when I was working in um, Peru, Chile and Brazil, 
um, representing UK government, you know, UK uh, industry, and we come to these meetings in Brazil, let's say, then um, the um, UK embassy, the DIT in Minas Gerais, for example, they've called all the big stakeholders to come in to their embassy and meet us, tent, right? Yeah. And so, so, so then, you know, uh, there's such a huge difference between for example, imagine, you know, um, like uh, one of Mongolia's cashmere companies comes to London, right? And there's a huge difference between those companies calling themselves uh, the big brands versus the Mongolian embassy calling those big brands and saying, you know, we'd, we, we invite you to come to our embassy <laughs> yes. and meet some of our right. uh, companies, right? So there's a whole like a systematic support right. um, and this whole like system in the UK um, built to support uh, their, uh, you know, our, uh, the companies to uh, make it easier to get into international market. And so I think that kind of DIT model is wow. super cool. Yeah, I expected to hear that uh, usually we face lack of maybe money of uh, financing so I expected to hear that maybe we need more fin uh, financing this industry but wow yeah <laughs> you tell, told me that from other side mm -hmm. so aside that um, financing this industry also they need to um, supply with connection right exactly and to unite all and rule this industry by policy making right exactly wow. exactly <laughs> but we have a small part where you told us about coding itself and you showed us it so let's take a look at the moment my time is kind of divided into two so i spent uh, part of my day uh, working um, uh, kind of doing satellite applications catapult my company work and then uh, the rest of the time i'm doing my phd uh, research so I guess uh, daily work, um, I think my day is quite varied at the moment. So uh, especially for the satellite applications catapult, I've got several projects. Uh, so I've got a project uh, working in uh, looking, uh, looking at um, uh, lithium exploration uh, in Bolivia, for example. Um, I've got another project uh, working with the finance industry. Uh, one of the recent projects that I did is, for example, uh, is that um, uh, training a um, machine learning algorithm uh, using uh, satellite data uh, to uh, recognize uh, cement plants from space, for example. It's because cement plants are um, very highly carbon intensive industries and it turns out that people don't really know where all the cement plants are, so we're, we're using um, uh, high resolution satellite data and thermal uh, satellite data to train a, a convolutional neural net uh, to recognize a kind of worldwide um, cement plants. So the increasing demand for green technologies um, is driving the need for more minerals and metals. And so if we are to avoid this existential threat um, posed by climate change and remain within the COP21 uh, commitments of two degrees, um, of uh, global temperatures, then um, there's an estimate of uh, three billion tons of metals will be required. And so all these metals uh, are, you know, we have increasingly lower concentration of ore deposits um, uh, with lower concentration of metals. So all these deposits, all this mining means uh, we have a huge waste problem. So for example, uh, here you are seeing uh, satellite data uh, kind of like um, the uh, deformation product uh, from satellite data. So this is the tailings dam and, um, you know, early on, um, so green is stable and red is kind of um, subsiding. So if you look here, uh, kind of just before failure, uh, you start getting these um, structures, these red structures, which is just before it failed here. And so if we want to visualize what's happening here with the satellite data, then I am using it here. So here, uh, all, so all this, all this um, code is in Python and uh, Python is an open source language. And so um, all of these uh, kind of uh, functions are there to help me visualize this. So but this is that bit which failed. So you can see here that it's deforming here around 20 millimeters. This blue is kind of going subsiding a little bit around like two, three millimeters up. 
But those sparkling eyes are really show me that you're really passionate in this. <laughs> <I'll treat. laughs> but uh, actually, you are a professional geologist, right? So <laughs> could you please tell us how that happened, uh, that transition, and uh, maybe who influenced on you, I mean, to become a geologist? Yeah, um, so my grandma. Uh, my grandma's a paleontologist um, and um, uh, growing up I used to go on these uh, paleontological expeditions, you know, roaming the Gobi Desert quite a lot and uh, there's been a very kind of, uh, the particular expeditions that um, inspired me is the American Museum of Natural History expeditions. So I went like three, four times and um, I have my, you know, mentors and best friends there and uh, basically, you know, I was so uh, fascinated by the fact that, you know, the, the scientists would be able to, for example, say, you know, 400 million years ago, there was like an <laughs> ocean here. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> or they'd be like, you know, there was a volcanic eruption here. And, you know, you can find dinosaurs there, but then you can't find them there because there's mammals there. You know, just they were just reading the copy, yes. you know, they were reading the rocks. And for me, that was fascinating. And, you know, we are from... You know, I love the Gobi and we are from one of the best places for paleontology and geology in terms of, you know, fossil deposits and in terms of ore deposits. We, Mongolia is right there in the top three, right? Mm -hmm. And so because of that, we have some of the best paleontologists and geologists in the world, like, you know, Dr. Barsbold and mm -hmm. uh, my grandma. And then there's the geologists like Dr. Orodma. So these are all, and Dr. Badamhan. So these are all the kind of golden age geologists and paleontologists of Mongolia who, who are one of the best in the world. As I understood, you have a really tough schedule. So, and uh, maybe sometimes you become overloaded, right? So in that case, what do you often do? I know that you are painting something, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and also we have a small part to with it, but uh, maybe sh should you tell us about it? Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, like recently, I saw this quote that I really liked on this topic, which is, you know, like uh, resilience is not about uh, how much pain you can endure, but it's about how mu how well you can recharge. So, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, uh, I uh, so. Based on that, I try to have quite a lot of things I do to recharge. So, uh, you know, on a daily basis, for example, I meditate. Um, I, on a daily basis, I read every night, and this is something I really helps me sleep better. Um, I um, also, I kind of, um, you know, on a weekly kind of scale, um, I try to exercise I, uh, quite a bit, and then. Every weekend, I try to have one very active day. So uh, that's kind of when I just try stuff, right? So uh, more recently, I'm doing a lot of kayaking in Oxford because there's loads of canals. Um, and pre-COVID, when you could touch people, <laughs> I, I've tried capoeira. So yeah, I try to have like a, on a weekly basis, uh, kind of like a one very active day. And then there's uh, lots of like daily little bits of things that help me recharge. But also I think, you know, um, I used to feel very overloaded when I didn't have good systems in place. So, for example, I have a, a deep work schedule. <laughs> so, you know, uh, like when you have like tons of work you have to do, um, you could either. So, you know, productivity is basically a combination of um, how much time you spend doing something and how intensely you do it. Um, so. For example, you know, you could be, you know, kind of like scrolling your web or your comp your phone, right. and then you could be kind of working on this thing, you know. <laughs> or you, uh, or I found that you know, you just increase the intensity, so then you work in short bursts of kind of sprints, I guess. So I have like an, you know, like an hour to an hour and a half where I turn off everything, all notifications, wow. and I just kind of like attack this problem, right? Mm. Um, and then... Concentrating on one thing. Exactly, like super attack it uh, mm -hmm. really intensely. And when you do something like that, I don't think you can work for that many hours anyway because then by the yes. end of the day you know by after like on average I think I do probably like th four hours of super intense uh, sprints mm -hmm. and then beyond that I'm kind of like potato right in the head uh, so then yeah like I guess there's lots of schedules as well like you know I have deep hours and then shallow hours in the shallow hours I kind of you know like scroll the internet <laughs> and answer emails and stuff like that so yeah I guess I'm kind of working out the schedule that works best for you to handle all the stuff you have to do um, plus all the things for recharging, I think, really helpful. Okay, them. now let's take a look at another part with your hobby, where you paint. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I really like painting. 
Uh, so I like painting uh, with oil on canvas. I used to really like uh, painting portraits. I was trying to kind of capture um, emotions, uh, uh, kind of like, I guess, yeah, uh, facial emotions. But now um, I'm trying to learn how to paint um, more landscapes like uh, these ones. So that's, I guess, yeah, like my mom and um, I guess, yeah, kind of capturing facial emotions was something I was really interested in. But now um, I've got this idea for a painting and I'm trying to, and that painting involves bits of portrait and a little bit of kind of um, like uh, mountains and maybe that mountain is a person. So kind of like a metamorphosis of some kind. How many paintings have I painted? I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, I guess uh, quite, I mean, yeah, um, I guess lots of scraps. So um, I, I wouldn't be able to put a number on it, but okay, so I guess like a more like a finished painting, probably only like one or two, because I don't think this is a finished painting. For me, this is not really like a piece of painting. For me, this is more kind of like um, walking towards uh, a piece of painting. So it's kind of, I guess, like studies rather than a finished uh, painting. You know, things just don't work the first time, so you just have to kind of keep going at it uh, for quite, uh, you just have to sit there for hours and hours and just stare at it and just keep going. So I think it teaches a lot of persistence. Well, I heard that you spent your childhood in England and Germany, right? So uh, could you please tell us uh, what cultural shock or difficulties did you face when you came back to Mongolia and how did you overcome it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think lots of difficulties with the, you know, my mom was a student and she was a single mom. And I guess when I was in the UK and in Germany, I kind of, I couldn't, I, I felt like, I, I mean, I think I was just, I spent a lot of my kind of early teenage years kind of wanting to belong everywhere. So I'd come back to Mongolia and everyone would be kind of like, oh, she's so westernized, you know, like you won't understand. <laughs> and then I'd be in Germany or the UK and they'll be like, oh, well, you know, you're not one of us. She's you're Mongolian. She's Mongolian, <laughs> exactly, right? So I think I spent a lot of time trying to fit in, but then mm, I think I reached a point where I kind of, it, it started this whole attitude of just kind of being like, actually, like kind of rebelling and becoming a bit anti-establishment and kind of being like, well, actually, like, I don't really care whether you want me to fit in or not, right? I'll be on my own. Yeah? Exactly. But, but then I think that attitude actually um, is kind of a part of me now. So, for example, uh, it, for both for my master's and for my PhD, um, I kind of, I came up with all the topics and it's kind of like, instead of picking a topic that is offered by your supervisors, it's more kind of like, hmm, you know, let satellites, geology, you know, I want to combine this, like, let me find some lecturers who kind of fit there. Wow. So, so then I guess it, it was good because it helped me kind of create this attitude of like, I'm like, you know, I'm not going to follow anybody or anything. Yes. I don't want people to box me. So I think that was, yeah, <laughs> lessons learned maybe. <laughs> so, and... Uh, I think while you were living in Germany and England, you become open-minded, you know, you, yeah? So you became more free than maybe children here in Mongolia, I think. What do you think? You unboxed mm. your mind, I think. Yeah, or I guess, you know, um, I think as a kid, you want to belong and you don't want to be different from anybody else, right? But then when, and, and you kind of want to, uh, but... The, uh, when you are the kind of foreigner, when you are uh, kind of, it's almost like you have nothing to lose. So then you kind of go, well, you know, like I am the one, like the odd one out here in all situations all the time. So I guess it's kind of made me be less scared. So I guess it's more kind of like, you can take risks because you don't belong anyway. So it doesn't matter. Right. You, you don't have much to lose, I guess. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you can be risky. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think so. So, and do you have a role model? Um, I don't think I have a particular role model, but I guess, yeah, um, like from my friends, from my family and mentors, um, I, I like, you know, bits of lots of people. I don't think anybody's perfect. I think, you know, <laughs> when you spend lots of time, you start also seeing, yeah. <laughs> and... Um, personal question so <laughs> so as I know you're not married yet right so and how do you imagine your future family and what kind of mother would you be what oh. do you think wow um uh yes I'm not married uh and um I think I have some pretty definite ideas on what I'd like my marriage <laughs> to be <laughs> so you know if I'm lucky enough if we if me and my partner were lucky enough to 
Um, Meat. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. So uh, if that does happen, and I, I hope we'll be lucky enough to uh, kind of... So um, I want us both to work part-time, for example. I think it's really important to have, you know, uh, it's more important for, for us. Exactly. Yes. So then, you know, I hope we can afford to live on a kind of one salary that's half of each, right? Or even have like long weekends. So um, I really hope uh, we can do that and then in terms of kind of the family and mother um i hope i can be if i'm half the mother of that my mom is then i'd be very happy and she's the kind of mom who's you know like just bathes you in attention you know she's she cares about every little niche thing that i do and i i don't think i have that kind of you know how, i mean yeah so if i can be half the mom my mom is then i really <laughs> like that but um, i guess um there's um I guess one of my ambitions for a mother would be, you know, um, I hope I'll be able to kind of develop my deep work schedule to such a point that I would be able to kind of finish on time. You know, if I'm working, I'd like to be able to not have to choose between career and family. I'd like to be able to still have a nice career Combining. and still exactly yeah. finish at 6 p.m. And then, you know, past 6 p.m. we don't talk about work, right? <laughs> but to do that, I think you have to be very efficient and effective. And this is kind of, you know, very productive in a short period of time. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my last question will be dedicated to your future plans. Mm -hmm. And maybe do you have a dream? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, in terms of future plans and dreams, um, I've got lots <laughs> and I guess it all depends on the kind of uh, time scale that we talk on and priorities shift. But uh, in terms of kind of long term plans and dreams, I think um, I guess the way I like to see it is, you know, um, humanity. Is, uh, so some of the biggest, um, you know, best thinkers of today have already outlined as what the problems are. So there's three main problems, as I see it, mm -hmm. as I've understood by people like, you know, Yuval Noah Harari or Noam Chomsky. And so the three problems of today are, one, you know, risk of ecological disaster and climate change. Secondly, risk of nuclear war. And thirdly, technological disruption. So, you know, climate change and ecological disaster may, uh, leads to things like, you know, food shortages. Food shortages make people unhappy. Unhappy people make war, right? So it's kind of like the root cause of everything, right? And then the third bit is technological disruption, so automation and um, AI. So in that case, you know, what about uh, when, what about, what are people going to do when there's machines doing all those jobs, right? So this, these are important big questions. And I guess I'm trying to kind of understand all the different ways in which, you know, my career and, you know, using satellite data, you can address a lot of this kind of climate related questions. Like how can we make, you know, uh, mining more environmentally friendly? How can we make agriculture more efficient? So this is, there's a lot of role satellite technology can play in this. And in terms of kind of like technological disruption, um, you know, I know a little bit about some of these technologies. So I'd love to collaborate with, you know, philosophers or politicians to kind of trying to address some of these problems. Um, so that's the kind of, um, questions that I'm trying to kind of direct my career towards and uh, but I guess also the way you do that is something I'm thinking about quite a lot right now which is you know um, we, we live in such a harsh capitalist society right now so you know if I for example um, to address some of these problems if I create an organization then I'd like that organization to be like a social experiment right so uh, for example in the UK uh, some of one of the most successful companies is called, uh, you know, John Lewis mm -hmm. and John Lewis owns Waitrose. So these are, you know, commercially one of the most successful companies, but They're the way they are... Based on experiment. Exactly. So mm -hmm. the, they are kind of like a very, like a friendly capitalism, you know, mm -hmm. so um, or the, the company is owned by all the employees, including the shop floor staff, you know, so so then you get part of the company profits and you get to have a say in how the company is run and you know and everybody gets to have a say in you know we invest some of these profits into our community so i guess it, uh, this is kind of the ideas of like noam chomsky so uh, kind of softening capitalism and doing these social experiments so yeah <laughs> <laughs> well brilliant and I'm really honored that I had you here today in our studio and interviewed you. Thank you very much for your coming and for your time. Thank you so much for having me here. Wish you all the best. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, today we had Earth Observation Specialist at the Satellite Applications Catapult in the UK, Ms. Marat Bayra. We will see you next time. Until then, please stay safe and thank you. <laughs>